Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. So I'm declaring today that if you will be a prisoner of hope, if you will expect something good to happen to you every day, I can't tell you exactly what day it will show up, but I can tell you that you'll be happier every day while you're waiting than you would be if you waited with fear and worry and anxiety and frustration and works of the flesh and all kinds of misery and hate in your life. I'm getting really happy up here. Now, you know, Job had had a bad deal. I mean, he, he went through it. And his friends sure didn't help him. I mean, they got, got around to blaming him and finding all kinds of fault with him. And just it just wasn't good. And in verse 10, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes when he prayed for his friends. <laughs> And the Lord gave, gave Job twice as much as he had before. When he prayed for his friends. Now, I have to just be honest with you today and tell you that I can preach a happy message all day long and leave everybody just skipping out of here, but this is not going to work in your life if you don't stop being mad at people. The promises of God do come with conditions. Faith doesn't work if we don't walk in love. Galatians 5 says, faith worketh and is energized and empowered by love. And love gives and love forgives. Too many Christians are angry. You don't have enough time left in your life to waste one more day being mad at somebody that's out having a good time and don't care that you're upset. Amen? Well, they didn't treat me right. Well, what, what would you rather have? Would you rather try to get them to pay you back or would you rather have God pay you back? Come on, I'm asking you a question. Do, are, do you really want to spend your life trying to make whoever hurt you pay you back? Or would you rather just leave them in God's hands, pray for them, and ask God to pay you back? God says, I will repay. I am your recompense. Why not just believe that hurting people hurt people and in all probability, whoever hurt you did it out of some kind of pain in their own life or some kind of lack of knowledge? What good does it do you to hate somebody who's really already in trouble themselves with God? No wonder God asks us as his children, pray for your enemies. Pray for people who act that way. Care enough about them to want to see them in heaven. Don't just help the devil destroy them by hating them. Hope brings change. If you want anybody in your life to change, don't go to lunch with your friend and say, I just don't think Charlie will ever change. That's my best motherly look. You know, there are ways that mama looks at you and you just know like, you know, the look. So now I'm giving you that look today. <laughs> no more staying mad at people. God's got a double blessing for you, and I want you to have it. Amen? Yeah. Hope brings change in our life. Let me just quickly tell you a few things. Ten ways change does not come. <laughs> Just in case you want to keep wasting your time, you can do these. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw it out. Worry and anxiety, that's, that's sure not going to change anything. Struggle and frustration, that's not changing anything. <laughs> Trying to change things by yourself without 
getting God involved in it, that, that don't work. Only the humble get the help. We learned that last night. Bright ideas. I know what I'll do. Sarah. Oh. Okay, I'm not having a baby. I'm going to give my handmaid to my husband. And uh, he can have intercourse with her, and then that'll be my baby. <laughs> How many Ishmaels have you had while waiting for Isaac? <laughs> so she got tired of waiting and got a bright idea. Oh. So sure enough, she had a child. Named him Ishmael, which means man of war. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what they had. You go ahead and have Ishmael if you want to, and you'll, change, you'll spend years changing his diapers. <laughs> Come on, Summer, you're tracking with me just really good. You're like, I, okay, man, I, yep, I got him right now. Here's another thing, way that change won't come. Hating the life you have right now. I just hate my life. I want a different life. <laughs> Embrace the life you've got and just see how good you can make it. Come on. Well, I just don't like myself. I don't like being me. Well, you're going to have to be you because everybody else is already taken. You can't be me. I've got me. <laughs> Come on, we got people here today, you don't like yourself. You're like, I don't want to be me. Well, you are you. Well, I don't like me. Well, you know what? You're in for a miserable life. You know why? Because everywhere you go, there you are. I mean, you're not getting away from yourself, not for one second. You got to go to the bathroom with you. You sleep with you. You eat with you. You drive with you. But I don't like myself. Well, <laughs> get a grip. It is what it is. Amen? Amen? Here's a good waste of time. Not enjoying where you're at on the way to where you're going. Being selfish and self-centered and never doing anything for anybody else, that'll make you real happy. I'm going to take a few minutes here and I'm going to talk to you about the importance of being generous and being a giver. Because if you want to get anything in your life, you need to sow some of it. It's a law that works in the kingdom of God. I've got some seeds up here. and So let's just say I see this package and, wow, I'd like to have tomatoes like that. Those are nice. Well, there's only one way that I'm going to get them. I've got to give up some of my seed and plant it. Amen? Amen. I'm going to take just a moment to share a story with you because what's happening in our society right now is giving among believers is decreasing it just is and I don't want to have to not be able to get the help to somebody that they need because people don't understand the importance of being generous and part of it is because it's not being taught as aggressively as it once was and so I've kind of just decided that here and there as God leads me, I'm going to do some more teaching on giving. You know, one of the reasons why people don't teach on giving is because people get mad when you do. Yeah, there you go. It's a preacher just trying to get your money. <laughs> oh, give me a break. You know, I'm 71 years old, 71 and a half. I mean, if I was going to be, I mean, come on. I am not doing this to get your money. 
I got a house, I got a car, I got 11 grandkids, and I've got a rocking chair. I could just go sit and rock my kids. I don't have to do this, and I'm not doing it to get somebody's money. Everything that comes in, we're giving it back out, trying to help people all over the world. Well, I heard about so-and-so. You know what they did? Well, I'm not so-and-so. I mean, there are doctors that are quacks, but that don't keep you from going to one when you need to. <laughs> I mean, the devil would love it if we got afraid to teach on giving because that's actually one of the most important things that you can learn. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Bring all the tithe and the offering into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that you cannot contain it. Amen? God doesn't need our money. We need to give. We need to give. Why is it so hard to just give up a little bit of money. <laughs> in 1 Kings 17, there's a story, and I really suggest you go read it for yourself. I'm not going to take the time to, to read it all, but Elijah was a great prophet, and there was a famine in the land, and he was living by a brook, and God was feeding him supernaturally by having, he got water there from the brook, and then ravens brought him food. And I love, the Bible says, and, and the brook dried up. You know, when your brook dries up, God's saying it's time to move. And God spoke to him and said, go to Zarephath, for I have provided a widow there that's going to take care of you. So he went and he found this widow, but the problem was, was she was, <laughs> I say, poor, broke, depressed, and suicidal. Now, wait a minute. I'm not just making it up. Huh? And that's who God sent him to. I mean, come on, God. I like the bird idea better. <laughs> Why would you send the greatest prophet in the land, possibly the greatest prophet ever, to somebody in that condition who said to him when he asked her for a morsel of something to eat, she said, we, I've only got one little bit of meal and one little bit of oil. I have just enough to bake one cake, divide it between me and my son, and then we're going to eat it and die. I told you she was suicidal. <laughs> she had her mind on death, not living. And Elijah said... Bake it as you have said, but give me a little of it first. Now, you know how that would go in the media today. <laughs> TV evangelist comes to town and robs poor, broke, depressed, suicidal widow. Amen? Amen? Well, if God was supernaturally taking care of Elijah, Elijah didn't need the widow. He didn't need her food. She needed a miracle, and in order to get one, she had to sow seed. Are you hearing me? You cannot have a harvest in your life without sowing seed. If you need hope, give some away. If you need a breakthrough, contribute to somebody else's breakthrough. What you make happen for somebody else, God can make happen for you, multiplied many times over. Amen. 
Another way that change will not come is feeling guilty and condemned about all the mistakes you've made in the past. Once and for all, will you let it go, get over it, and go on with God? Today. Not another day. Today. Running to people for help instead of running to God. Seven ways change does come. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. Prayer. With gratitude and thanksgiving for what you already have. If I'm already negative and grouchy about what I've got, why should God give me more to complain about? So we need to have a foundation of gratitude in our life. That goes without saying, thank God in all things for this is the will of God for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Thank God in all things. That's why my devotional for next year is 365 days of gratitude. We need to practice till we get it. Amen? How thankful are you? I would like to become the most thankful person on the planet. Amen? And I've got a ways to go. The Bible says, be thankful and say so. It's not good enough just to be thankful. We need to say so. We need to show appreciation to people. We need to tell God and other people how grateful we are for what he's done in our lives. Prayer is so powerful. Make this year a year where you pray more than you ever have before. And I'm not talking about having to be on your knees hidden away somewhere. I'm talking about praying your way through the day. I asked God to help me with this many times this morning. But just right before I came out again, Lord, help me. This is you. You got to do it. And I'm planning to thank him when I'm done. And then I'll get on the plane and pray for a good trip home. And then I'll go to the restaurant and pray for a good meal. Amen? Amen. Pray your way through the day. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Get your hopes up. Keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be opened unto him. I mean, be determined in prayer. I mean, I tell God sometimes, and I'm not being irreverent, but I'm just telling you, this is in your word, and I'm not going to shut up. <laughs> Until I see it happen in my life or for whoever I'm praying for. And that's not being irreverent. The Bible teaches us to be persistent, not, not with a, a you owe me something attitude, but Hold God's word up to him. The Bible says pray the word and remind him of his promises. God, this is what you've said and I'm expecting. I'm expecting to see this take place in my life or in the life of the person that I'm praying for. Come on. Get your hopes up. Treat other people good while you're believing for things yourself. Mm. <laughs> Pray and say. Wait expectantly and hopefully for the change you need. Keep a good confession while you wait. Number four, wait with patience and a good attitude. <laughs> Be a blessing to others while you wait. Do your responsibility but cast your care. And number seven, don't let what you see disturb you. Romans 8, 24 and 25. Aren't we just having too much fun today? Amen. 
This is the happy place. For in this hope we were saved, but hope the object of which is seen is not hope. <laughs> for how can one hope for what he already sees? But if we hope for what is still unseen by us, then we wait for it with patience and composure. Come on, we're going to read that again. Hope is for when you don't see. So you don't get hopeless because you don't see anything happening. That's exactly when you need hope. We have hope until we have the manifestation. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope, the object of which is seen, is not hope. For how can one hope for what he already sees? <laughs> but if we hope for what is still unseen by us, then we wait for it with patience and Composure. I'm going to be a prisoner of hope. How about you? Amen. And then finally, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It is the title deed and the down payment of the good things that are to come. Be a prisoner of hope. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. We started on Thursday night with really a, a real word from God that he was going to deliver people this weekend from depression and all of its relatives, <laughs> which is basically anything down because Jesus said, look up because your redemption draws nigh. He's our glory and the lifter of our heads. All this down, discouraged, depressed, despondent, despair, all that stuff is from the enemy. And that's not the way that God wants us to live. That's not the destiny that Jesus purchased for us with his blood. Hope deferred. Not having hope is what gets all that started in our lives. It makes the heart sick. The heart becomes sick. So I'm declaring today that if you will be a prisoner of hope, if you will expect something good to happen to you every day, I can't tell you exactly what day it will show up, but I can tell you that you'll be happier every day while you're waiting than you would be if you waited with fear and worry and anxiety and frustration and works of the flesh and all kinds of misery and hating your life. I'm expecting God to do great things. I'm expecting God to do great things. You know, I get tired when I do these conferences. I wake up tired by the time Saturday morning rolls around. And, you know, I always trust God to reward me in some way for my hard work. And so I'm kind of curious to see what God's going to do. I'm expecting God to do something Come on, why don't you just start having fun with God? Why don't you just be his son or his daughter and let him take care of you? Why don't you just get rid of your religious attitude and start saying, God, you're my BFF. You're my best friend forever. Amen? And I believe that something good is going to happen to me and through me today and every day. Amen. Well, let me repeat just one more time. Expect something good to happen to you today and every day. Gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory here. Prison. 
Zij, die achter zulke muren leven, zijn mensen. En Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. Ik ben hier voor een third degree burglary. Ik heb een lengthy sentence van 400 months. De judge looked at me and said. I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here, so they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away. Um, that somebody does value us still. And that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. In het leven lopen we hier en daar butsen en schrammen op. Sponsor over. Maar sommige beschadigingen kunnen het leven volledig lam leggen. Hoe overwin je woede en bitterheid? Lees het boek van Joyce Meyer. Doe jezelf een plezier. Vergeef. En start bevrijd aan je toekomst. Bestel je boek. Doe jezelf een plezier. Vergeef. Via joyce-meijer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. The Holy Spirit comes into our life to teach us, to train us, to lead us, to guide us, to convict us of sin, to convince us of righteousness. And I just want to encourage you before I go to the next point that you need to absolutely refuse to live with guilt, shame, blame, condemnation. Because it is not God's will for you. Meer uitdagende gedachten vind je op het Joyce Meyer YouTube kanaal. Het bekijken waard.